The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Live and Learn. I'm your host, Jerry Renault. One of the fantastic programs in the state of Nebraska is OLLI, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, offering great classes and great trips. Here to talk about all things OLLI is the director of the OLLI program, Bob Nickel. You don't want to miss it. Hi everyone, I'm Julie Masters. The use of robotics is of interest in supporting people as they age. Joining me today is Dr. Carl Nelson, a professor in mechanical and materials engineering in the UNL College of Engineering. Stay tuned. Have you recently updated your estate plan or have thought about your designated beneficiaries or other things that might be called just stuff that you own? I'm Doug Jose. Today we're welcoming Andrew Loudon again to come and visit with us and keep us up to date on what is happening with estate planning. Stay tuned. This and more on today's Live and Learn. Hello and welcome to Live and Learn. I am your host, Jerry Renault. Today we want to talk about OLLI, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of Nebraska and all of the great things that it's offering. And here to uh, talk to us about that is the director of that program. It is Bob Mickle. Bob, thanks for being with us today. Thanks, Jerry. It's always great to be here and share all of the exciting things that are going on with OLLI. And OLLI is just, it has so many great things. I, I'm in the class right now and uh, continuing to, uh, to get involved in, in as much as I can. It's just, it's just a great program. And um, we have lots of great classes and we want to talk about the, the session uh, that coming up and starting in January. But there's a couple of other things that uh, it's always kind of fun to talk about um, that, that are going on. And one of those has to do with the membership. You are just growing by leaps and bounds. Yeah, we're just killing it. Uh, we've had an amazing beginning to our year. Our membership uh, at the end of uh, three months is already greater than it was at the end of the entire year last year. Uh, we've had fantastic responses from our showcase events. Uh, both in Lincoln and Omaha, and, and people are just generally excited about everything that we can do. Wow, that's great. And uh, I know that um, you have to renew your membership on a regular basis, and you're offering a special sort of deal for that uh, right now, right? Mm, that's right. What we did is we offered all of our members from last year a chance to renew their memberships at a discount rate if they would do it on our online uh, process. And it was something just to say thank you for what they've done and, and for their continued support. It was also very helpful for our office staff because everything was done uh, by the members themselves through our process. Now the last time you were here we talked about a new computer system. Is that yeah. Is that it's, on and working and, and successful like you had it's, hoped? It's been 100% successful Wonderful. and it's just so easy to work with. Yes. Great. Great. Now um, before we start talking about the classes, um, you just got back from a national conference. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, lots of really good things I think that you learned, but you also made a nice presentation. Uh, well, absolutely. Every uh, 18 months, the Osher Foundation puts on a national conference, and there is a uh, staff member and a volunteer that attends from all of the 125 Ollies across the country. I was asked, <coughs> excuse me, I was asked to give a promotional uh, presentation about how multi-format classes work. Uh, the opportunity to teach classes in person and uh, on Zoom at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it was very well received and, and it's very satisfying to know that a lot of the things that we're doing are leading the way for other Ollie's to be as successful as we are. And you know, I had a chance to teach a class like that where it was in person and it was online and it was, mm -hmm. it was really interesting. Are you, is that something you're going to continue on down uh, as we move forward in Ollie? Absolutely. If anything, what we've learned from the COVID is that there are times when people are just a lot more comfortable just staying home, whether it's bad weather or whether they just aren't up to getting out that morning or the convenience because I've got something else going on a little bit later. So uh, if I can stay home and still catch the class, I can get to my other things as well. So yes, uh, it's about 40% of our enrollment that, that takes oh, uh, wow. Zoom courses. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk about the upcoming session. Uh, I'm um, 
Uh, assuming that the sort of the regular classes that you offer all the time are going to be there, we always have bridge, we always have ukulele, uh, we usually have some sort of tai chi program. You, you've got some others that you offer as well. You know, the fitness classes are the ones that, that seem to be the most popular repeats. When we, so we do those every term, whether it's general yoga, dance, fitness, Friday. Those are just fantastic classes that always fill up. But then we have those that seem to be uh, so popular that we keep bringing them back because we have wait lists and so it's been fantastic that uh, the people volunteering to teach those classes say yes I'd love to come back and do that again and so all of our members are satisfied because they get an opportunity maybe not at the time they want it but maybe in the next term or, or a term following and I would encourage people to, to, to get on that wait list even if you don't get into the class that you wanted we were we were on a wait list for for the Tai Chi class and the instructor just went oh heck I'll take two more it's fine it's great so uh, so I would encourage people to get on that wait list well, sometimes there. that happens but the other thing is that tells us uh, if there's a long wait list let's offer this again because right. people want it yes Perfect. Okay, let's talk about uh, some of the classes. There really were some incredible classes, so we can't really get to them all, but um, one of them is uh, about Edith Wilson, the first lady who really ran the country. Um, it's only uh, a couple of, of sessions. I think it's on Tuesday afternoons, but this one just sounds fascinating. What can you tell us about this class? Well, let's not forget, uh, Edith Wilson was not the president of the United States. Right. Uh, her husband, Woodrow Wilson, was. Uh, but Edith was a, a very uh, wealthy, beautiful, intelligent uh, Washington, D.C. businesswoman. And when her husband fell sick, and, and sick for a lengthy period of time, uh, he had a near-fatal stroke. Right. Uh, the question became who really was running the country and so uh, all of the, the the visitors the paperwork the personnel decisions they went to Edith and and basically she was trying to save her husband and save the country all at the same time so uh, she's regarded as as one of America's uh, probably most influential and complicated women in the sense of what she did uh, uh, wielding that unauthorized power that right. she used right that should be just really uh, fascinating. Um, another class um, that caught my eye was um, the Vietnam War Origins, Impacts, and uh, Legacy. This one starts in January, goes through all of February on Wednesday afternoon. I know this is a class that's going to fill up. This is a this is an era that sort of continues to be of interest to lots and lots of people. Um, you have some insights into some of the things that are going to get talked about here? Yeah, last summer, uh, Governor Pillen visited Vietnam, and he was pursuing trade opportunities. So now, now we're talking 50 years uh, earlier, in, in March of 73, the last American soldier was uh, uh, taken out of Vietnam. And so a lot of those people might recall that uh, helicopter evacuation photo uh, from the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. So uh, uh, retired Major General Roger Lemke is going to teach this class oh, and wow. he's going to talk th about the decisions uh, or the uh, origins of the Cold War, uh, the traumatic uh, 1960s and then the American involvement, the withdrawal process. Uh, so who would have predicted that 50 years after that helicopter liftoff uh, that a state governor uh, and the United States president would both have visited Vietnam. Yeah, 50 years ago, that's almost frightening, isn't it? <laughs> For those of us of a, of a certain age, uh, that'll be a great class. Um, another class we want to talk about co sort of coincides with a holiday. It's called Martin Luther King Jr. Beyond the Dreams. It's again uh, a class that starts in February, a couple of dates. Um, it will be near the holiday on Thursday afternoon, uh, always uh, always a fascinating subject um, and what he did and what he was able to accomplish and sort of interesting to look at life now and make that comparison. Exactly. Most of us know that Martin Luther King had a dream, okay? Uh, but there's so much more to know about him that maybe we don't know. Uh, so why does he continue to be such an influential figure? Um, and, and so Reverends Jim Keck and uh, Tremaine Combs are gonna share uh, King's theology uh, their ideas uh, or his ideas and, and, and explore uh, his path towards maybe a more radical form of, of Christian activism, um, especially towards the end of his life. Yeah, there's, there were all kinds of interesting rumors uh, around about um, 
uh, about Dr. King, um, and I assume they will get into some of that, <laughs> that, uh, that as well. Um, so that should, be, uh, that should be really, really interesting. Okay, another class that's coming up has a really nice provocative name. <laughs> it's called Fascism, A Warning from History. Starts at the end of January, goes into February, again on Thursday afternoon. Fascism is a word that gets tossed around in um, political circles from every which way. So I'm, I'm truly fascinated as to how this is going to, um, to be set up and the kinds of things they're going to talk about. Well, fascism is a, a loose and incoherent uh, and, and conflicted collection of ideologies, myths, and, and hatreds. And it really is somewhat difficult to define. And so to understand the concept, you have to kind of understand its history. And so we've got a UNL lecturer in, of the history department uh, who's going to explore its origins. And he's going to go back into uh, Mussolini's history, or Italy. Uh, he's going to talk about how it worked in uh, Nazi Germany uh, and its continued effects after the Cold War uh, and, and other manifestations through history. And so uh, the, the plan is that when it's all said and done, he's going to finish up by helping people to be in front in a better position uh, to identify and maybe confront possible fascism threats um, before it's too late. Right, right. Because again, it is, it is a term that both the left and the right uh, seem to want to use and, and call each other. And yet I'm, I'm not sure we haven't forgotten about the original um, way that this was created um, during World War II. And, and we're hoping that Mr. Foreman, the instructor, uh, gives us that information. Yeah, should be wonderful. And it's a, again, it's a, it's a wonderful title. <laughs> um, another uh, great class being offered with a wonderful title is called Great Decisions uh, 2024, uh, Part 1. Uh, so I assume that there will be a Part 2 uh, <laughs> somewhere, somewhere down the line. This starts in late January and goes uh, into uh, March. Um, great Decisions, love the title. So tell us... Uh, a little bit about what kinds of things people could expect if they took this class. Yeah, and Jerry, you're right. This is a two-part session. We're going to offer part one in our winter term, and then the second part will be in the, the spring term. And what happens here is this class basically discusses uh, major, major foreign policy issues, uh, those that face the United States. And uh, uh, the Foreign Policy Association has selected eight topics so we're going to explore the first four in the third term, the winter term, and then the other four in the spring term. Uh, things that you're going to see in this upcoming term are uh, the Mideast uh, realignment, uh, climate technology and te competition, science across the borders, and then the fourth one is going to be the U.S. and China uh, trade rivalry. So there's no controversial topics none, <laughs> in, none whatsoever. In, this, in this particular uh, class. What's neat about this class is it's offered, uh, it, all of these are uh, multi-format, but getting people uh, on the screen in Zoom and the, the conversation back and forth uh, amongst the people is really great because what happens is we show about a 20-minute film and then it's all just moderated, uh, led conversation most oh, okay. of the time. So, uh, it's very fascinating to sit in on those. Yeah, uh, the moderator has to be pretty good about, you know, some Zoom, some uh, in class, and there there can be some differences of opinion and certainly some controversial oh, kinds of will kinds be. of things. But um, uh, it should be a really uh, interesting discussion. I would absolutely think. wonderful. Any other classes just that you could think of you want to mention just briefly? Well, um, I, I think the last one that's kind of interesting is the one that's called The Heart of Lincoln. And, and we've been looking at doing this for a number of years and, and sharing with the people who come a little bit about the human services uh, that the city of Lincoln pr provides, nonprofits, for example. And so we're going to have all kinds of people coming in from these nonprofits and sharing what they do and how they benefit Lincoln. And, and that's going to extend over uh, a number of periods uh, I think it's four weeks, and, and so people will learn how the city of Lincoln works uh, to help each other. That should be wonderful, and it does. It starts in, in pretty early in, in January, on the 24th, and then the 31st, and then the first couple of weeks of February. Yeah. So um, that should really, really be a, a, a fun class. Bob, thanks for coming by today. Everyone should look for the catalog. That catalog will be out? Uh, late probably December? late December, okay. yes. 
It's in production right now. Okay, and uh, if they have any questions, uh, then things we didn't get a chance to talk about, um, what can they do? How can they get a hold of Ollie? Our website it has uh, a plethora of information. They can simply go to ollie.unl.edu, or if they want, they can call our offices. Our, our, our number is 402-472-6265. Bob, thank you so much for coming by today. We truly appreciate it. Ollie is just this uh, great little gem um, in the state of Nebraska, and um, we appreciate everything you do, and uh, it's a wonderful program, and thanks again for taking some time to stop by, because I know we're right in the middle of the session, and you're a busy guy. Well, thanks for having me. I uh, appreciate it. Stay curious. And thanks to all of you for tuning in today. I am your host, Jerry Renault. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and remember, it's never too late to live and learn. Aging Partners has relocated to Victory Park, 600 South 70th Street, just east of the old VA hospital. Follow the signs around the south part of the building complex and enter under the Aging Partners sign on the east side of the facility. The new fitness center is equipped with state-of-the-art cardio and fitness equipment. Caseworkers and resource specialists are available to assist you with a variety of aging issues. Enjoy a hot lunchtime meal and engage with others in a variety of activities. Aging Partners, now at Victory Park. Hi everyone and welcome to Live and Learn. It is my great pleasure to have with us today Dr. Carl Nelson. Dr. Nelson is a professor of mechanical and materials engineering at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Welcome Dr. Nelson. Thank you, good to be here. Oh, it's great to have you. Would you be all right throughout the interview if I referred to you as Carl? Of course, Julie. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, Carl, tell, tell our viewers what prompted you to pursue a career as a professor as all, and also a researcher in mechanical and materials engineering? I would say it started uh, as a kid with taking things apart and putting them back together and trying to understand how mechanical things work. You know, okay. it, was, it was the bicycle would break down, the chain would come off, or the tire would be flat, and my dad would come out and we would fix that together and he would explain, you know, this is how this fits together and how this works and what it does. and um, you know, that just kind of hooked me onto engineering. I just loved the discovery of that and how mm -hmm. to understand the world around me, especially the mechanical things really attracted me. And Absolutely. then, of course, going through uh, college and graduate school, I just kept sucking that up and just drinking it up. You just loved it. Yeah. And what a compliment to your dad to get you excited about engineering through something as basic as working with a bicycle. And he's, and, yet and he's not an engineer type at all. And so this was, you know, this was just him being dad and teaching and, and you know, being there. So it was great. Him being dad, though. So it's, it's kind of a, a good way to suggest to other dads in the world, you could have a budding engineer in your life. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Right? It could happen to anyone. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Carl, so you know, I think for our viewers, and frankly, I have office down the hall from you for several years, I'm not quite sure what a mechanical and materials engineer does. So could you tell our viewers a little bit about what you do in terms of your line of work? Sure. Uh, engineering in general is just applying math and science to problem solving and, and uh, making things better for life in the real world and, and improving on systems that we have in our, mm -hmm. in our daily life. Uh, mechanical engineering is that with the focus on the mechanical systems which include not only machines and mechanisms mm -hmm. but uh, things with heat transfer and fluid flow and all that sort of stuff. That's fascinating because I think we, we go into a building or we get in a car or we drive on a road and we don't realize how much engineering has made a difference in terms of making our lives better but also safer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's everywhere. So, Carl, you know, as in, in the course of our discussions, one of the areas that you've been interested in is robotics. So, could you talk a little bit about what it's like to teach about robotics and why it's of interest to you in terms of your academic portfolio? Yeah, uh, robotics is a really fun topic, both to research and to teach. Uh, it really involves, it takes, first of all, it takes me out of my zone of mechanical engineering because it involves um, not only mechanical engineering, but some electrical engineering and some computer science. And so really to develop robots, um, sometimes it takes partnership and sometimes it takes uh, learning some skills outside of your main discipline. Um, you know, teaching robotics, I, I'm teaching a class right now that, uh, that covers all sorts of interesting application areas 
collaborative robots, soft robots, um, different architectures of robot, different, just, you know, you see robots used in all sorts of different applications from agriculture to firefighting to uh, rehabilitation and, you know, of course, industrial uses. So um, I think as far as the research goes, you know, that's part of the excitement for me is finding those new application areas and places where contributions can be made in the field of robotics to, um, to make life better in a variety of ways. You know, in making life better, um, thinking about, particularly for our viewers who might have an interest in the aging experience, how, Carl, does your work, your research, help inform your understanding about aging and how it can be supportive to older adults in the future? Well, when I teach uh, design uh, alongside robotics or mm -hmm. mechanical systems, um, which is, a, you know, design is a big part of engineering. Uh, is taking the principles of engineering and applying them to create new technologies. Um, when I teach design methodology and design principles, I always emphasize to students uh, the need to understand the problem very well. Because if you start on the wrong foot, you'll end up on the wrong path, on the wrong solution. And uh, so understanding the problem that you're trying to tackle and really understanding it from the user's point of view, whoever is going to use that product or system that you're developing. In the context of aging, you know, uh, we have to put ourselves in the, in the shoes of an aging person. And so it's that, it's that empathy, that understanding of um, your demographic, of your user base, that is so important to, uh, to develop products and systems for an aging population. And that's a you know, it's a little bit of a departure. You know, we have to learn to speak a little bit of a different vocabulary, perhaps, in order to inter interact and, and interface with gerontologists and other, mm -hmm. other professions that um, know more about aging and the aging experience than maybe most engineers do. And I appreciate that the, the interest in wanting to make life better for people as they age. Now, when we think about aging, it certainly is a global issue. And one of the countries um, that is really being faced with an opportunity of aging is Japan. You just recently returned from Japan and attended a conference on robotics. Mm -hmm. So what did, what did you take away from that experience? Well, Japan is an interesting place. It's a great place. Um, you know, in this conference that I attended, there were some uh, research presentations on uh, robotic systems, particularly for aging populations or disabled populations, um, you know, exoskeleton robots. Uh, okay, now I'm going to have to ask, what's an exoskeleton? An exoskeleton, mean? I mean, you think about an insect, right? It's, any, it's a structural uh, shell that exists outside of the, the body, around the outside of the body of the organism, right? So an exoskeleton for a human is just a structure that is wearable outside of the body on the, on, on the surface. Oh, and interesting. And an exoskeleton okay. typically would be um, a device used in rehabilitation that you could wear on your legs or even sometimes a whole body exoskeleton that helps you with your, the movement of your limbs. Um, even in, uh, in industry, sometimes you see these exoskeletons, these assistive uh, arms to help people who have to work above their head a lot or who mm -hmm. support heavy loads. Um, so, you know, you see developments in this type of area, exoskeleton robots for just helping people to, to bear loads and um, you know, in some cases, regain movement that has been lost through injury or, or illness. Um, the other applications that are prevalent, um, you know, that could apply to aging populations uh, include monitoring. So robots not only just for the physical tasks, but also for the, the kind of diagnostic and, and sensing tasks to watch out for, you know, has somebody had a fall or is there something abnormal about the behavior um, that needs to be reported so that others can come in and intervene and, and help. Um, you know, I already mentioned the exoskeletons and, and therapy, physical therapy, um, but companionship. You know, s robots are used for more and more social purposes. Mm -hmm. And in Japan, um, Japan has been a great adopter of all things robotic and just really open to new ideas. And so you see r really interesting uh, looking robots, <laughs> frankly, you know, <laughs> right? robots. And our with, viewers are seeing some right, of those now. Robots yeah. with faces, robots that interact and try to emulate, um, you know, social behaviors, 
And so it's, an, it's actually an interesting debate in the robotics community as to whether uh, you know, using a robot to achieve a social task is, has the same value as uh, you know, having a human be there with a person. And you know, so there's plenty of work to do in robotics, not only from the design side, but also from the understanding of those interactions um, you know, between humans and robots. Well, I think, and, and you had mentioned it earlier, but I think it's worth um, asking the question again, how can engineers work with people who are gerontologists, people whose background is the study of aging? How can you see those two groups working together? Well, I think, first of all, we are not at odds, right? We are working on the same goals. Mm -hmm. We just may speak a different dialect or <laughs> use different toolkits. Um, you know, an engineer's main role is to, uh, you know, solve problems that are preventing a better quality of life. And a gerontologist's job, or any most many other professions, is frankly very similar, right? So, uh, really, all it boils down to is establishing communication and learning to speak each other's language. And you know, when I teach, I mentioned teaching design earlier. When I teach design, and we talk about defining problems, um, and we talk about trying to find empathy with the, the user of the product. It's about learning that dial, dialect, that um, you know, understanding how the other person in their shoes perceives the problem, and then using that understanding to really pursue solutions that are going to um, affect positive outcomes. And so it's just, it's that interaction, it's that dialogue, it's that um, you know, learning about each other and, and caring about each other, really, mm -hmm. that allows us to work together and just multiply the potential for solving these types of problems. You know, I, I would suspect that our viewers are very encouraged by the approach and attitude that you take in the classroom in preparing future engineers to have empathy for the end user. Think about anybody who tried to program a VCR <laughs> several <laughs> years ago thinking, who did this? So you know, a question that I ask most of our guests is, and I want to ask this of you, Carl, is what gives you hope? Well, uh, I would say faith, uh, family, and other supportive um, interpersonal relationships. And, and I just have a general optimism for the capacity of people, human beings, to uh, do good things and to work hard and to be uh, smart and, and capable and just develop mm -hmm. their skill sets and apply those in, in good ways. So it's all those things. It's all those things. Well, I think, Carl, you have certainly given all of us hope in terms of the work that you're doing in the College of Engineering at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And for our department, I hope we have the opportunity to, to continue to collaborate and engage in coming up with uh, good ways of supporting people as they age. So. Carl, thank you so much. And to our viewers, remember, it's never too late to live and learn. Aging Partners has relocated to Victory Park, 600 South 70th Street, just east of the old VA hospital. Follow the signs around the south part of the building complex and enter under the Aging Partners sign on the east side of the facility. The new fitness center is equipped with state-of-the-art cardio and fitness equipment. Caseworkers and resource specialists are available to assist you with a variety of aging issues. Enjoy a hot lunchtime meal and engage with others in a variety of activities. Aging Partners, now at Victory Park. Estate planning is important for all of us, but keeping up to date is particularly important for seniors. Welcome to Live and Learn. My guest today is Andrew Loudon, who's a previous guest. Uh, welcome back, Andrew. Thanks. Great to have you here. Well, thank you, Doug. I'm thrilled to be here. Andrew, uh, the statistics say that 40% of uh, Americans don't have an estate plan. Uh, let's start off by say, talking about what is an estate plan or how would you define an estate plan? You bet. Well, an estate plan are documents that say where your property goes when you die and who is in charge of making sure that that happens. And at a base level, you really need three documents. A last will and testament that will say where your property goes and who your executor is. And then most people need two lifetime documents as well. A durable power of attorney for finances that says if you're alive but mentally incapacitated, who handles paying your bills and making sure your income taxes are filed correctly. 
And then perhaps the most important document is the health care power of attorney, that advanced directive that doesn't just talk about end of life, although that's probably what most people think about, but if you're mentally incapacitated before you die, who decides where you live? Who decides who your doctor is? And then yes, in an emergency or an end of life situation, in consultation with your treating physician, who makes that ultimate decision about whether to remove life support and allow the natural dying process to take place? So a lot of these things can change over time. So that's why it's particularly important to think about, you know, am I up to date? Absolutely. You know, think about where you were 10 years ago. Uh, we're sitting here in 2023. What was life like for you in 2013? A lot different, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. Maybe a loved one has passed away. That's right. Uh, maybe you've retired. Maybe you have a new grandchild or great-grandchild. Maybe you inherited property and things look different for you. So, you know, it sounds self-serving, but we strongly recommend that you go back to your attorney or your financial advisor or accountant every three years, six at the most, and say, let's take a look. And I meet with a lot of clients, Doug, who they come in and everything's fine. Uh, there's no need to change it. I will say on powers of attorney, we're running into a lot of situations where large financial institutions and large healthcare institutions will not respect a power of attorney that's older than 10 years old. They should, but they don't really care what Andrew Loudon in Lincoln, Nebraska thinks. The legal department in San Francisco says, if it's older than 10 years, mm. we're not gonna respect it, which frustrates me. But now when I'm meeting with clients, if that power of attorney is more than 10 years old, even if it's the same people, we're gonna do a new one. So just updating them. You yeah. bet. The, uh, let's talk about legislation. Um, you were intimating that uh, something's coming down the pike in a couple of years. It's a little bit off, but what, what's, uh, what's coming along in 2026? Our current federal estate and gift tax laws are under the auspices of the Tax Act of 2017. And I remember when that passed, I remember knowing that at the, it was written this way, it was going to expire or sunset at the end of 2025. And I remember thinking at the time, 2026 is a long ways away. Well, 2026 doesn't feel like a long way away anymore. And so if whomever is president in 2025 and whomever is in Congress in 2025 don't do anything, on January 1, 2026, the current laws for estate and gift taxes and income taxes will expire and we will revert or go back to the 2011 laws. So there's going to be a lot of changes. The... Uh, the mistake that a lot of people have is is keeping up to date but you you do have a top 10 list of <laughs> maybe it's kind of a negative thing but rather than uh, uh, positive but you do have a top 10 list of mistakes so let's talk about a, a couple of those uh, the the first uh, one of them uh, being what uh, the beneficiaries and and we talked about estate plans and and uh, some of those definitions, but what about beneficiaries? Well, I, I'll address that, but I gotta tell you, you know, I've given the same speech for about 20 years. I've been a lawyer for 25 years, and for about 20 years I've given the same speech called the top 10 mistakes made in estate planning. And you know, my father and brother are both ministers, and they rightfully so tease me. They say, you've been given the same talk we have to come up with original material every, every Sunday week. morning, okay? If you gave the same sermon, even once in a couple years, you're gonna get called on it by parishioners. So, um, yes, and the, the number one mistake that people make is not knowing that whomever is the beneficiary of your IRA, your 401k, your life insurance, anything that has a beneficiary, if that's different than your will, the beneficiary controls. In other words, it doesn't matter what your will says. If your will says everything goes to my three children equally, but your life insurance just goes to one child, that one child will get all the money, not the three. And a lot of people don't know that. Twice in my career, I've had an ex-spouse get the IRA, which is not what the person who died wanted. Now, that will never happen again because our section of the Bar Association went to the legislature and changed the law. So now a divorce nullifies. But in the past, ex-spouses, because they were the beneficiary, would get those IRA benefits. So the, another one that you have on this list is naming the wrong person to, to sort of take care of things. Is that, is that a problem that you see often? 
Absolutely. You know, I think the most important decision that you can make is who is your executor? Who's going to take care of things after you pass away? I can write the nicest looking will or trust, but if you name the wrong person to carry it out after you die, it won't go well. Is your child an alcoholic? Are they a procrastinator? Are they just mean and uh, are going to be mean to their sister because they're jealous of her success from childhood? Uh, naming a child oftentimes is the wrong uh, person to name. We're big believers in independent third parties. We're very fortunate in Lincoln, Nebraska to have many locally owned banks and trust companies that will perform that service. So sometimes removing the family dynamics is the right way to go and naming a professional to handle your estate. Now we often don't think about the end, but sometimes uh, we leave decisions up to the last minute. Is that a problem? So I got to tell you, Doug, in March of 2020, our phones rang off the hook. When the pandemic hit, our work mm. tripled. And the reason is everybody who had put this off or had started the process with us freaked out about dying, rightfully so. And so I firsthand during the pandemic saw the disadvantage, the mistake of waiting to the last minute when you're worried about uh, being on death's doorstep. There are two reasons that's the wrong thing to do. Number one, when I go into a hospital room, I've been summoned, and you, you can bet if someone calls, it happens about once a month in our high volume practice, they've been given a bad diagnosis, the end is near. They go right to the top of our list, we fly to their relief, and I walk into the hospital room at Bryan Hospital, and mom's there in the bed, and, if, and sometimes I've known mom from church for 30 years, and if she looks at me and goes, who are you? And then she looks at her son and says, who's this guy? We got a problem. She doesn't have mental capacity, and that's, too, that's sad. It's too late. We cannot sign a new document. Sometimes it's not clear, so we need a medical opinion. The other problem is almost always when I walk into that hospital room, there's mom in the bed who's seated in the chair right next to mom, adult child. And I'll ask mom, okay, mom, I hear you want to change your will. What are we going to do? And the answer doesn't come from mom. It comes from the daughter who says, well, mom would like... To, and that's not going to happen. So we have to politely excuse the adult child, sometimes that doesn't go over very well, from the room, and then I need to talk with the client and make sure that there's no undue influence. We've talked about uh, some things passing on. Uh, we think of land and, and uh, other financial accounts. What about the other stuff? You know, Things and stuff, I like to call it. Uh, but it's what lawyers call tangible personal property. Most estates go well. Most kids get along. It's, you know, the bad situations that stand out. But even in a family where everybody gets along, it's difficult to divide things and stuff. Did mom and dad live in the same house for 50 years? I'm going to bet a few things have accumulated. And so the family gets together. You know, it's easy to divide a bank account by three. It's easy to sell a house and divide the proceeds by three. It's impossible to divide mom's wedding ring or dad's favorite shotgun, to use the top two examples, jewelry and firearms, between children or nieces and nephews. So we deal with this head on in the estate planning process. When I meet with a client, I talk about a laundry list that's attached to the will or the trust that is where you can say who gets your family heirloom or your favorite piece of furniture that was your grandmother's. And then at the sentimental value really drives these issues that person receives it, which is our number one goal in estate planning, is that the client's intent is carried out after they die. Andrew, you've talked a lot about uh, children and, and so on. What about charitable donations entering into this whole estate planning area? Well, charitable intent is wonderful. And I just love when I'm, I met with a, a couple yesterday, they don't have children and they're leaving all of their very sizable estate to four charities. Those charities are going to be really happy. Uh, and you know, you say weird things in estate plan. I was about to say when they die. They won't be happy that they died, but they're going to get a really big, nice gift. And that's kind of fun. And I love it. But I'll tell you, the big thing there is taxes. So especially in this current environment where most people don't pay the federal estate tax, we just got, as of uh, two days ago, we know what the annual amounts will be in 2024. Breaking news for your audience. So the gift tax amount next year in 2024 will be $18,000 that you can give as, to as many people as you want. 
and the federal estate and gift tax exemption in 24 is going to be 13.6 million. That means you have to have an estate larger than 13.6 million, which most of our clients do not. It makes people laugh when I say that. I have a lot of farm clients and many of them are, but most people are under that 13 million. So the bottom line here is if you give money or assets to charity, chair qualified charities do not pay income or estate or inheritance taxes. So you're going to save on taxes, which if I can disinherit the government, sorry to say that sitting here in the city council building, uh, that's a good thing. I like to disinherit the government. We talked about <clears throat> this, but a, a part of, of this giving is, is establishing your legacy, so, which I, I, I like to talk about people thinking about their legacy when they're drawing up their estate plan, not just what happens to things. Uh, how do you look at that? I think it's very important. Um, when I have a client who wants to make a, a major charitable gift, I encourage them to go to the charity and have a conversation. You know, what would you want the money used for? Most charitable organizations have gift planning officers who will help you develop your plan. And it's really convenient because if you change your mind about maybe a certain program at your church or, or a program that you support at the LEAD Center, for example, then you can go back to the charity and say, no, I, I want to do, I want to help Christian education maybe more than mission. Or, you know, at the LEAD Center, you know, I want to help, help bring more Broadway shows to Lincoln. Boy, hasn't the LEAD Center been great this year? I, we're going to all of them. It's just awesome. But, you know, that's something you can do. And you can do that with the charity. And it's really a thoughtful process. And to your point, builds a legacy after you pass away and, and during your lifetime. Andrew, thanks a lot uh, for being with us. But uh, do you have some uh, sort of summary comments of experiences that you've had in the last year or two since we first uh, visited on Live and Learn? Absolutely. You know, I think just don't put it off till it's too late. Uh, talking about your own death is not fun. We try no. to make it fun in our meetings, but it's not fun. And so just don't wait too long. Now is the time to give your attorney a call, and especially back to your point about the laws changing in 2026, estate planning lawyers are already starting to feel the crunch. Every estate planning lawyer I know is super busy, and so don't wait until 2025 to talk about the tax law change. Give them a call today. Uh, this would be the time to set up an appointment. Andrew, it's a pleasure to have you as a guest again. We look forward to uh, having your visit with us uh, to keep us up to date on these uh, laws uh, as they relate to estate planning. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Joes. Remember, it's never too late to live and learn about estate planning and keeping up to date with your particular estate. Aging Partners has relocated to Victory Park, 600 South 70th Street, just east of the old VA hospital. Follow the signs around the south part of the building complex and enter under the Aging Partners sign on the east side of the facility. The new fitness center is equipped with state-of-the-art cardio and fitness equipment. Caseworkers and resource specialists are available to assist you with a variety of aging issues. Enjoy a hot lunchtime meal and engage with others in a variety of activities. Aging Partners, now at Victory Park. Hello everyone and welcome to Live and Learn. We have a different kind of a little segment here for you in December. It is Christmas time and we thought we would play uh, a few Christmas songs for you. Uh, joining me here in the studio, of course, is the irresistible Gene Davis as part of Gene and Jerry. And so um, we're going um, we're gonna to play a few songs for you. A couple of them you probably will uh, never have heard before since they are some originals. And then we're going to play a couple of traditional songs as well. This one is a traditional uh, holiday song called Let It Snow. Oh, the weather outside is frightful, but the fire is so delightful. And since we've no place to go, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Oh, it doesn't show signs of stopping, and I brought some corn for popping. The lights are turned way down low. Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Now when we finally say goodnight, how I'll hate going out in the storm. But as long as you hold me tight, all the way home I'll be warm. Now the fire is slowly dying. My dear, we're still goodbye. 
But as long as you love me so, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. fun great old traditional song it's not what we really want to be happening outside but i i like the sentiment of uh, yes holiday time is uh, about being with the ones that you love and this next song is some uh, song that i wrote about with the one i love in mind one called don't blame santa Don't blame Santa if he's a little late. I told him I've got something and it just won't wait. Don't blame Santa, he's got a lot to do. I told him I'd be taking good care of you. Got candles in the window, garland and a tree. So if it's just the two of us this Christmas Eve, don't blame Santa, blame me. Well, we'll skip the milk and cookies and have a little wine and sit the up together by the fireside. We spent the whole year waiting, being good and being nice. Let's get a little naughty on this cold, cold night. Do I have to spell it out from A to Z that you're the only woman in this world for me? Don't blame Santa, blame me. Take a walk together, find some mistletoe, we'll sing a couple carols, make an angel in the snow. We'll leave a note for Santa that he is sure to see that we don't want to be disturbed till New Year's Eve. Don't blame Santa, he said you never wrote. So I tried to find a gift to set the perfect note, but all that I could think of was my heart. It's wrapped in silver paper, tied up in a bow. I hope it's what you wanted, dear, but if the answer's no, well, don't blame Santa, whoa, whoa, blame me. Keeping with our uh, theme of uh, kind of Christmas love songs, I guess, um, here's another um, original song. Came about in sort of a an odd fashion. Wasn't really thinking about trying to write a song, but uh, was thinking about what are the best things about Christmas and. Um, 
presents are nice and parties are nice, but it's really sort of being with uh, someone or some ones that you uh, really love and uh, really enjoy and uh, get a chance to spend that time together. So this is uh, uh, what this song is uh, all about. It's called All I Want for Christmas. Christmas from you is a smile It's all I need and I know it's gonna last me a while Baby, baby, when things get tough and I've had enough I know you're the one to make it all right Cause baby, all I want for Christmas is you tonight Jerry is playing a mandolin on our show today, and uh, the mandolin, of course, uh, came over in the uh, uh, European immigration, and um, there are many stories about the mandolin that I won't tell today. <laughs> That's probably a good idea. But um, anyway, I became very associated, closely associated with bluegrass music, and we got a kind of a bluegrassy version of a traditional country Christmas song. This is one, uh, the traditional song, I Saw Three Ships of Sailing, and we're going to have Jerry play a little bluegrass style on it. Saw three ships a sailing in on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. Saw three ships a sailing in on Christmas Day in the morning. All the bells on earth will ring on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. All the bells on earth will ring on Christmas Day in the morning.
saw three ships a sailing in on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. Saw three ships a sailing in on Christmas Day in the morning. All the bells on earth will ring on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. All the bells on earth will ring on Christmas Day in the morning. Christmas Day, saw three ships a sailing in on Christmas Day in the morning. Thank you very much for tuning in. We appreciate it. We are Gene and Jerry, and we want to uh, thank all of you for tuning in as well. And I uh, want you all to stay safe, stay healthy, and remember it's never too late to live and learn. And Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Okay.